Clay, when this episode, The Next Generation of Star Trek Picard's third season opened, and I saw Beverly Crusher standing over a wounded alien that she had clipped with a plasma rifle, and then she just summarily executed the motherfucker, I knew that Star Trek was back, baby. Star, Star Trek, Trek is, is back. <laughs> Star Trek, punch it. Even with a kill shot, as Riker called it. You know, I, th- that joke, I was thinking about that joke. And then as the episode is going on, and then they actually bring it up later on, yeah. like Riker and Picard mm-hmm. talk about it, interestingly. So I'll still have something to say, but I guess it lost a little bit of the, the impact because the show does clearly seem to recognize that <laughs> she killed someone. <laughs> Although Picard does uh, do a little bit of backflip there to say it was a defensive shot <laughs> when, well I, <laughs> when in your, I think, when you're standing over someone is begging for their life and you execute them, I, don't know if that's I actually the, i actually like that bit in the scene because Riker's like uh yeah she executed him pretty and it seems like this is an execution and he's like i don't know i'm sure it was defense and Riker's just kind of like i don't i don't know man <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the second best investigation scene after the uh, fuck scene in the wire, where the where McNulty yeah. and Bunk are just going fuck, fuck, <laughs> fuck, 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 fuck. I like the I like the end of it when Riker's just like manhandling the ashes of the dead alien. <laughs> going like, well, have you ever seen ashes like this before? <laughs> if nothing else, I am going to recut that wire scene over the the audio of the wire scene over this sequence of Picard. Just like, fuck, <laughs> fuck, 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 fuck. So. This is Picard season three. We are here with the next generation. It's the first episode of the third season. Came out on February sixteenth, twenty twenty three. Written by Terry Mtalis, uh, Terry Metalis, <laughs> and directed by Doug. Where's he from? What planet's he from? I think he, I think he comes from the the, the distant unknown world of Metalis. Directed mm. by Doug Arniakoski, who's been on the show forever. In this episode called The Next Generation, after receiving a cryptic, urgent distress call from Dr. Beverly Crusher, Admiral Jean-Luc Picard enlists help from generations old and new to embark on one final adventure, a daring mission that will change Starfleet and his old crew forever. So, how do you feel about getting back into Star Trek Picard, Clay? Um, Not just about this episode, just in general. Just in general. Yeah, um, well... (laughs) The thing I'll say, the way that I feel about it is that I, I feel like the show understands how a lot of people will feel about it, and boy, do they go out of their way to make sure they, they you know this is a different show. Mm. Um, they they jettisoned the entire opening credits. Um, they rely heavily, heavily on music from the old show. Uh, the only character to return is Rafi. Um, it's... <laughs> And uh, and uh, Laris too, but it's it's. Uh, I thought man. she was dead. If you had bet me money, I would have said Laris died for some reason at the end of the second season. <laughs> I was shocked to see her. But you know, over the closing credits, it's all classic music and cl- like they yep. they legitimately they use. I think it's the the theme from First Contact, yes, as well as the original theme, um, and all the graphics are retro uh tng inspired graphics and stuff yeah. it was I, I actually really liked the credit sequence i thought it was cool yep but uh but yeah man they are um moving on i yeah it's so my my overall impression of this episode is i'm kind of of two minds about it because i actually liked it i thought it was tonally i liked it and there's a lot of stuff i liked about it um but i feel like they're trying a bit too hard for with the reset button hmm. um and also it's very weird to see a tone that i like shot like an episode of discovery where it just apparently in the 25th century nobody has lights i guess yeah and it's so dark like everything is so dark yeah um so that's a little jarring to see those two things kind of clashing but overall i thought it was a pretty good start would you say it's the would you say it's the tone of the show, or would you say it's just Frakes, really? Because I was going to say that yeah. like the the brightest light that they have in the show is Frakes' performance, because it's the only thing that has like a little bit of glow to it. Like, I, true. Yeah. I um, I was less than impressed with this one actually. Like, I like the the way that I would say that this is the way that I would praise this is to say that this is better than seasons one and two so far. But yes. That's like the the bar there is so low that you can't even trip over it. It's just like on the ground. Yeah. And so 
we've also always kind of liked the first episode of the first yeah, seasons. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And I go, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, the, the only thing about this is that like, I, there are two things going on in this, I think like, so one is there's an incredible amount of, uh, Easter egging going on. Mm-hmm. And two is that I only see the flaws of how this is going to fail as we move into the season. Like I, <laughs> I, I, I see all the same things that the old seasons did, except they have not fucked it up yet in this first episode. Um, I think I thought it was remarkably similar to the first and second season of these shows. It's just that Frakes brings a different kind of energy to it that is like unique to the Picard series. Yeah. And is kind of like happy to be there. Um, and the fact that the show went out of its way to reference old stuff like you and I'm, I'm so cynical about it. But even like so, like the endless amount of references just kind of make, makes you think about the old show. And so it's hard to avoid that. But I um, will get into it. But I, I, I definitely see that this is the same show as what has come before it. And I'm not going to be surprised by what happens, I don't think. Well, I actually I thought there was one other bright spot. Um, that I think does actually uh, separate it from the other two seasons, and mm-hmm. that's um, Captain Shaw. I really liked him. I thought he was great. Yes, uh, great. He great actually, performance. yeah, and I actually think he's a well. He, he's he's positioned well as a character mm-hmm. because he is the antagonist, but his antagonism is is based in uh, the fact that he's just doing his job. Like he's he's not going to give his ship over to these two crazy old guys and and it's i like i like that by they found a way to make him an antagonist without making him a villain which i liked mm-hmm. um Ooh, see, I, and I, would also, just, I guess i yeah uh, sorry go ahead and, well i was just gonna say i also like that it, it was a it, it was a bit of an inversion of the uh uh the the TNG crazy admiral trope where every time an admiral comes onto the ship he tries to take the ship over and they have to stop him and it's like oh that's what they're doing but it's Picard that's trying to take the ship over yeah yeah they they do they do invert it I I like Shaw too and I think in a better I'm, I'm very I'm going to be very prejudicial about this like I think I I don't think that it's going to pay off I I see him he's going to match the discovery admiral from wherever they jumped into the future thing Mm -hmm. so here's my here's my uh, shaw's a good example about the focal point that i see is like the good and the bad the good is that he's clearly better defined and he has sort of like an idea about what he is in terms of versus picard and Riker and everything like that like Mm -hmm. you know they do the the show is not well written, but the, they do the clumsy metaphor of like he listens to classical music and Riker likes jazz, and therefore they're gonna, you know, get into an argument about that. He 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 goes a little bit too far when he's like, I like music with tempo and rhythm. It's like what the <laughs> fuck? Like what kind of jazz you know, is this guy listening to? White people stuff. <laughs> but it's like he could he couldn't have, they couldn't have just had a line about like I'm not an improv a fan of improv. I stick to what's expected of me. But they have him say mm. ridiculous things like he doesn't like tempo or something. Um, Shaw's issue is that he's a good example of what the modern Star Trek shows do, which is that he's set up as a villain. And I think he is set up as an, at least an antagonist, if not outright a villain, because of his antagonism towards Picard and Riker is over the top, but also... The show does not want you to take the understanding that he has a rational objection to what they're doing at all. It it doesn't think that Shaw has a legitimate gripe with anything. It's very similar to Discovery when someone would tell Burnham, are you fucking crazy? Don't do that. And then she would mm-hmm. do it and it would turn out all right. And they'd go, well, I've got egg all over my face for telling you not to do that insane shit that you just did. This show wants you to believe that Shaw is being a hindrance to Picard and Riker and he's being unfair towards them. When all that they've done is hatched a cockamamie plan to basically seize a starship from a captain Mm -hmm. and go off and do this mission. And Seven betrays her captain too because she knows she's supposed to support the good guys in this show. And I don't think this show is ever going to get to a point where Shaw is like seen as a legitimate character who's saying, 
hey, old men, I'm not just going to go to the end of the fucking universe for you people. Sorry. Like, we have some rules here. And a, a better show would have an actual, like, there'd be a little bit of conflict about what Picard and Riker have done. But that's not this show, I don't think. How am I wrong about that, I guess? Or do you disagree? I, I mean, he, we've seen him on screen for five minutes, so I can't really make that call. But, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I actually think that they set him up as... Even he's a little he's brusque about it, obviously. But I think the stuff that he says is all right, and I think that the fact that they set up Seven of Nine as someone who is uh, bristling against Starfleet and I probably wants to get fired, so she does the thing that she's not supposed to do anyway. I think that's all set up relatively reasonably well. Mm-hmm. Um, I I don't think I, I'm I'm not going to say you're completely wrong because obviously these shows don't have a great history of uh, of pulling that stuff off but i think as it stands right now i don't think that he is positioned as as a as a villain uh as much as someone who is just giving them a uh who is an impediment who is not he's an impediment um without being evil about it uh but it is still he's a, he is still an antagonist without being a villain at this point yeah why why do Picard and Riker think that they can get a, can do this? Like what's the I don't know. I mean, I guess they they're just to assume that they can lean into their uh what's the word? Uh their legend basically? I guess in their um fuck. Uh They're like um they, Credibility their, or their uh, yeah their credibility in their rank and stuff like that hmm. and I mean he brings up that they try to do something stupid and he's like yeah well you're retired and you're a captain and this isn't your ship yeah so he all of the reasons that he shuts them down are completely rational yeah what yeah I, I it's it's tough to avoid getting into the 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 point, the, I guess, the the problems that I run into are that you start thinking about the plot a little bit too much, and it's like, so they chose a ship with an incredibly hard ass captain just because Riker knows the ship, you know, like, yeah, why? Well, I mean, I I don't think he doesn't know the captain. I know, but why? Then why wouldn't that be that would if you were if you were to go off on this tangent? Wouldn't you choose a ship that was someone you like either know or or you are aware that they're not going to be a hard ass about this stuff? I the re- the reason that they go to the Titan is because Riker is the captain of the Titan in this universe, or he was right. the captain. I think it's I think it's under I think it's under the auspices of it seems less suspicious for him to be visiting the ship that he once captained or something. Yeah, I guess I I, I see. And I mean, he knows he obviously knows that seven is the is number one on that ship, so he knows they have at least one ally on there. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, I don't know. I, I, so I, I guess if you wanted to, if you want to lead off, I suppose about like I, I, so, your, your so favorability just, of it. What just the other thing that was like if yeah, just from like a larger writing standpoint it's like yeah i guess they could have chosen another ship with a less hard-ass captain but then you have no conflict there no i know and and i get that and that's why sort of picking on it doesn't make a lot of sense but yeah when you i i guess i guess the better place to approach it is that like what is the plan that they've hatched here and and the plan falls in line with the way that this series writes itself which is that Riker says i have a plan and then they start kicking stuff off, and he slowly reveals what the plan is to you mm-hmm. as it's going on. There's never a sequence where characters are going to talk about what they're about to do or do anything like that. So it's all this like, here we're going to yeah, go here, know. we're going to do the Titan. I just feel like if you're going to hide, if you're going to do something that it's vitally important for you to get to this place, and you aren't supposed to involve Starfleet. Why is he going to Starfleet to a ship that's incredibly difficult to get him to do what he needs it to do? Yeah, you know? uh, it's. I mean, I. It's the easiest way to get 
a starship? I, Why don't I'm, they do don't the know. first season thing and get a freighter and just go out there and do something? Like he yeah. was explicitly told not to involve Starfleet in this because this is another thing. Starfleet's going to be evil for some reason in this season, and so they're, they're going to be the cause of all this shit. So I don't know. I, I find it. I found the repetition that they're just doing the same thing over it, and I over did notice, again. I did notice that the setup was remarkably similar to the first season of its. Somebody calls Picard from his, somebody from his past calls Picard, and then Picard needs to go get a ship and needs to go put a crew together to go figure out what's going yep. on. Yeah, Laris you know. gets on her knees in front of him, and I go, "What the? Hell? Oh, okay, she's just going to talk to him <laughs> like that." It's it's incredibly the same. It's incredibly the same. I'm I'm fairly like I. I'm going to be fairly hostile to it just because I I think that the one thing that's going on here is that th- this is a it's a reference palooza and I'm also a little bit I've been talking too much but like coming off of um just in terms of the writing we're doing Deadwood obviously at this point this show does not think you're intelligent for watching it it does not think the audience <laughs> understands anything that's going on in it because Characters will repeat what they've been saying, and it brings to mind the Swearingen quote of like, "Don't say to me in different fucking words what I just said to you," mm, mm-hmm. because it's like, what, what is the um, the Picard beeping scene, right? Where's the communicator? And he's like, "Computer, yeah. what's that?" They're like, "It's a communicator." He's like, "Where is it?" He's like, and he starts digging through all of his old relic stuff, and he finds it. And he's talking to the computer about it. He's like, what is this? They're like, someone's sending you a message. He's like, a message on my communicator? They're like, yes. He's like, it's got a codec. It's a message. I can't believe this is my old communicator. And after like five minutes, he just goes, why would someone send a coded message on an old communicator to me that I haven't used in 20 years? And it's like, my (laughs) God, you think we are incredibly stupid, Joe. That scene did have an accurate depiction of what it's like to talk to an Alexa, though, because at a certain point, he asked a question, and it was like, (laughs) The the temperature outside is like no, just shut up. Yep, yep. Would you like to? Would you like? Have you get Alexa telling you it's like? Do you want to send a thank you to your driver? It asked me that every <laughs> once in a while. It's like no, that's that's fine. I You're getting a that. subspace codex sent to your old twenty year old communicator. I've also noticed that based on your order history, it's time for you to reorder dogs well dog treats. <laughs> would you like me to do that for you? <laughs> I find. The, the repetition of the dialogue and the way the characters repeat what they're doing is it also just ties into the show continues to be unclear about who this is for. Is this for people who love Star Trek The Next Generation and don't re- need reminders about what is going on? Or is it for people mm-hmm. who are clueless and need to be told through clunky exposition how everybody relates to everybody else and how they haven't seen each other in 20 years or whatever it is that's, that's been going on? Yeah, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question because like there's... I do think that communicator scene is a good example, though, because it's like if you've ever watched an episode of Star Trek, as soon as you hear that noise, you know exactly what it is. Right. Yeah. And so there's no reason for Picard to need to, like, talk it out. Like, you know, (laughs) you just need him to find it and then pull it out. Even Um, if you don't know what it is. It's right, not yeah. hard to grok what's going on on that thing. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. It's just. It I mean, I can understand. I can understand consulting the uh, the computer about yeah, what, what exactly yeah, is what being sent is. to it and yep. stuff like that. Oh, sure. But because sure. um, you know, obviously, the question the question is rational. Why Why is someone sending me a message on a twenty year old communicator for a de- decommissioned destroyed ship? Yeah. Um. But yeah, I do think there's there's probably too much of that. There's uh, the the opening scene with on Crusher's ship was interesting because at first I thought it was the villain ship because obviously there were no lights on and I assumed <laughs> that was where the bad guy stayed. Sure. And they're doing this pan through the room and they go past basically an iPod an iPad that's playing a, a captain's log from uh, uh, Picard. Yeah, best and of both worlds. Yeah, and for a second, for, my first instinct was, okay, I guess we're just going right into the reference well here. But then my second thought was, you know, when has anybody in the history of Star Trek listened back to one of those logs? Yeah. They're always recording them. Nobody's listening to them. And so I was thinking, it's like, oh, is the bad guy getting information about Picard by listening to his logs? That's actually kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then it then it turned out it was Crusher's ship. And my thought was, wait, is she listening to Picard's logs like a podcast to fall asleep? Because <laughs> I basically that's basically what I do when I put on Star Star Trek and I can't sleep. She's listening to the greatest hits, the best of both worlds. Well, even that though, even that though, it was like, okay, I'm not sure why. I, I mean, maybe it comes up again later. But then I was, I thought it was just a. a reference for the sake of a reference but then the code that she gives picard is is that something that they actually did on the show it must that, it must be that the virus myriad, thing myriad codec or whatever it's yeah. called yeah like, i don't that's remember actually it. that's that's kind of a clever callback yep. um if to use as a plot device because it is something very specific to something that they did um and it forces him to have to consult somebody else on the ship because he obviously wasn't there when they did it right yep when he was incapacitated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I um the things that I the things that I like about it are I think Frakes is probably the MVP of it, really. Yeah, like definitely. at least like you know, the conversation between Riker and Picard at least feels like there's a little bit of something there. Frakes brings a levity to it that like no yeah. one else does yeah. for this stuff. I I will say though, he is the bright spot pushing through the darkness of this modern Trek patina that's on everything. But even he is not immune to it. No. Because when he meets Picard in the bar, Picard gives him a sob story. And then, then his reaction is, Yeah, my wife and kids don't really want to see me anymore at this yeah. point. I was like, what <laughs> and the Picard fuck, gives him a. <laughs> They were so happy in the first season. Why can't they just be happy? Like, is it not more interesting if it's like Riker decides to go on a mission despite his family, his family instead of yeah. instead of he's he's been on staying the outs at the, with the, Deanna again. <laughs> he's been staying at the Best Western down the street, and he's got he needs somewhere to log uh, shack up for. Yeah, a I mean, bit. I'm I'm all for having characters have problems and and stuff but have at least one person whose life isn't a mess yeah but i mean man if you want to talk about bad writing that scene with rafi when she's buying drugs from the from the orion yep. guy yep. oh boy that was like <laughs> she, she sits down next to the guy and she's like, they kicked me out of Starfleet. My girlfriend left me. I'm trying to kick. I'm I'm, I'm hooked on drugs. I'm like, okay, thank you for catching us all up as to what. I'm mean, obviously it's a it's a cover because she's undercover or whatever. But yep. it's just like if I was that Orion guy, I'd be like, baby, you're trying way too hard. You are a cop. Although it's not really, it's true exposition, right? It's not true in the sense that she's not telling right. it to this guy, but it's it's right. exactly what's happened to her. Yeah. yeah. Well, she, I mean, she wasn't kicked out of Starfleet, I don't think. Well, is she back in Starfleet? Oh, it's unclear because she's doing yeah. some sort of mysterious thing. Um, so she might be. I, uh, I did roll my eyes real hard when uh, <laughs> they dropped the red lady on us. And I was like, what the fuck, man? Why yes. does it have to be red? Yep. Did, did, we had the red angel in Discovery. I mean, at least for the sake red of everybody, Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, for the sake of everybody, at least the red lady thing, they wrapped it up in the first episode by just blowing up that building, which even there was like, okay, I guess we're doing this again. We're, we're going to kill. The weapon, you mean that Rafi's chasing Yeah, the super them. weapon and up, oh, they've, they've hit us at home. That, that whole sequence felt so disconnected from it. Like, okay, so as far as like, Stuff that doesn't like track, right? Mm. When you have Rafi, she figures out the red lady thing, chooses not to contact her secret contact to tell this person that she's figured it out, but flies back to Earth, tries to was communicate that Earth? with people. Sorry, I don't, I don't. Oh, I don't know. I I assumed it was because okay. I assumed it was like Starfleet headquarters or something. Oh, uh, okay. I don't think it is, but I, I don't know enough to well, counter- whatever, whatever it, is. it is. Yeah, whatever it is. The the, the the it's an outpost somewhere, if not Earth. Yeah. Yeah. The computer. The computer person said, "Find out what the red lady is," and so she did that. Yep. She didn't tell them what it was. She flies there and is ineffectual in watching this thing get destroyed. It's a big building that's got a huge ass Starfleet sign on the top of it. <laughs> how come 
out on the outer rim or whatever, the Titan doesn't get a message saying, come the fuck home. They just killed 10,000 people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, I guess it's a small, I don't know, small thing. <laughs> they were seeming to have trouble communicating too because they weren't answering uh, Rafi. So I didn't know if that was some sort of byproduct of the weapon and no one's going to know That's about true. it. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. I mean, you know, maybe, I don't know. You, I, I It's a lot of. Uh, ex- extrapolating out that it maybe is. isn't isn't fair, but it's like you think, well, you know, if somebody if a Starfleet gets attacked, you'd think all the ships would know about it pretty well, quick. But I think we're just we're stuck at the first episode problem, right? Where we we're going, maybe this is going to be explained at this, you know, like maybe there's mm-hmm. an explanation that this weapon causes communication disruptions or something. Uh, but I, knowing the show, I wouldn't be surprised if that is not the case, and we only realize it five episodes from now. Right, like we we mm-hmm. only start to realize what's the pro- where the problems are coming in terms of the plotting in that aspect, and like I don't think this is outrageously badly plotted or anything. I think that the strengths of it are, and I can't remember if this is similar enough to the first episode of the other two seasons, is that they haven't added enough to the cake to ruin the recipe yet. So it's mm-hmm. it's like fairly straight ahead. What I know is what is out there in terms of the narrative threads it's really just raffi and picard are the two plots that are running in this one Mm -hmm. so you don't have a lot of room to be like oh everything is sort of piling up and it's all going to be a a problem i think that it's just um where what it has in simplicity i think it lacks in any sort of like interesting uh content within their journeys to different places so picard and Riker don't really say anything interesting to each other at all the entire episode, which is, mm-hmm. you know, they're just kind of getting to point A to point B. Raffi's undercover, figures out the plot of the weapon. I d- there's no... Um, there was a refreshing number of sitting and talking scenes, though. I suppose. I mean, there's the Shaw scene. The Shaw scene is my favorite just because of that, because it actually people yeah. like sat down and, and talked to each other. I, it, it does... It does feel like it's a lot of just getting in motion to get to the place that's going to do the thing. Mm -hmm. And I wish that the show didn't do that quite as much as it it tends to do. But I thought it was at least coherent the entire time to do that. Um, I think that... I mean, I'm in a... I'm in a tough place with the... amount of callbacks in it really like they're, they're going to go great guns this season it looks like uh with this stuff and you have these weird sequences of just like laforge's daughter who's called like drunk driver laforge <laughs> or whatever it is you know what that scene so th- that scene reminded me of was uh there's a clip going around are you familiar with the the fox news guy greg gutfeld yeah yeah there's a clip going around of him telling this awful joke on one of those roundtable shows right well i guess one of the the <laughs> women the, one of the women on the panel is very tall and he yeah. and he just go he just goes you know you know I, I you're real tall i bet i bet in school i bet i know what they called you they call they call you stilts was it stilts <laughs> did they call you stilts <laughs> i bet it was stilts it's like that's what it felt it was like Riker going crash crash <laughs> laforge because you crashed the ship twice <laughs> that's why they call you crash yeah well, Riker will be on the, the Red Eye Hour, if that show still exists, with Gutfeld. <laughs> <laughs> was her name something like Stiltskin or something like that? Like, was the actress... I, I, I actually have no idea, okay. but it was it was just like... <laughs> it was like it was like bombing to a room of four friends and not understanding <laughs> that it was going poorly. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, I don't know. I feel like I had a lot to say about this I, episode. Sorry, I gotta go back to the Red Lady thing. When they... <laughs> <laughs> when she pulls up, when she figures out what it is and pulls out that picture of an ugly ass giant fucking red statue, I was like, "What? <laughs> <laughs> Who? They're gonna dedicate this thing? This is the ugliest statue I've ever seen in my life." Yeah, and I live in Boston, where that Martin Luther King thing. Yeah, is. Oh yeah, the penis statue. It's a good statue. Why can't? Here's a thing to sculptors. Just sculpt something that looks like the fucking thing that we're supposed to be doing. Don't go <laughs> yeah, crazy uh, with it. You know, people do art in different ways. Oh it doesn't have God. to all be 
completely representative of, of the subject. It does. It absolutely <laughs> does. For a, for a, a, a the sculptor was trying. The sculptor was trying to uh, represent a certain very specific moment between mm-hmm. two people, and he only chose he. I maybe didn't didn't look at it from every angle, but I mean, it's not new for Boston because there's that uh, there's that uh, witch finder statue in Salem that when you right. look at it from the right angle, it looks like he's grabbing a gigantic dick. So yeah, Worcester has the uh, the turtle boy statue. It looks like a guy's a little kid is just fucking a turtle from behind, nice. which is nice. a great a great classy thing to says welcome to Worcester. Um, my favorite thing about. It's all these little details. My my favorite thing about the the Raffi where she is uh, talking to Worf, I have to assume, uh, who's like yeah, the probably. AI that she's talking to because it says you're a warrior. Um, she said he he she's like you don't know how hard it is out there, and the thing goes back. I do know actually, and it pulls up a record and it says like severe drug addict, and it pulls it up and shows <laughs> it to her, and she goes, "Wow, you sure know about a lot about me for a secret handler." It's like. What the fuck that's else because, is a secret handler supposed to know? That's because I wrote the show and people need to be remembered how oh, fucked up you are. My God. Like, why? It's in our, your record. It's the only character trait we know about you. Why wouldn't your handler know that you are a drug addict? I, so I think that they are in that moment. I think they are trying to walk a line because I think there are probably, although maybe not. I don't know. Mm. I, I I think they're probably thinking, all right, this is... Star Trek The Next Generation Season 8. There yeah. are people who may not have watched Seasons 1 and 2 of this show who are fans who are specifically coming back for this. There are people who are Fairweather fans who might be coming back just specifically because it's a TNG thing. Yeah. So we do need to catch some people up on these new characters who've been around for two seasons because we know they ain't going to fucking watch Seasons 1 and 2 before they do it. Yeah. That's... um. It was incredibly clumsy, but whatever. Yeah, yeah I, I guess it's like it. Well, that's understandable. That actually makes me respect the show less, you know, because it's like because when you, when you're accommodating to that degree, it means that it, on like I know that they have no faith in the the first two seasons of this, but like to just sort of like abandon it and be like, yeah, the first two basically didn't exist, and so we know we're getting this influx of new viewers, so we should just explain this to everybody again. Mm-hmm. You know, it's you're not really. I don't, I don't. It's not great I, art or anything, but it's just the show is not. The the show. <clears throat> my problem with it is that the show is is clearly just a product at this point, and yeah, this season's even more egregious than the first two. I think in in the way that they just these things about like Riker's talking about like Guinan's hawking like starship memorabilia or something, and. Mm-hmm. You know, he's like, he's like, who wants a fat one? <laughs> and the bartender says, I don't want the fat one. Um, I just, it just. But Wes, he's talking about himself, <laughs> not the ship. <laughs> it's just. Um, Metaphor. I Symbolism. just. Uh, I don't know. It's just, it It feels weird to me. It, maybe it'll, maybe I'll, I'll settle into the season and things will change. But at this point, it just feels I'm really um I think I think one of my I think my biggest criticism and I apologize for talking so much is that it it feels it all feels very repetitive to me. Like mm-hmm. the enemy ship looks like the Star Trek 09 ship basically. It's yeah, spiky. Yeah, more or less, yeah. Same um idea. the plot is reminiscent of getting off the ground in the first season of Picard. I don't know how many times we can watch a starship leave space dock with swelling music and expect it to mean anything anymore. I don't know. It works every time for me. <laughs> Does it, as work? As, it doesn't work. As long I'm as so the bored. ship looks, as long as the <laughs> ship looks cool, I'm here for it. Like I, I was actually wondering about that because I'm looking at the Titan and I'm yeah. thinking Neo okay, Constitution. Yeah, I'm thinking this feels like a very retro design. This feels like a like a. a original series movie era design yeah um it feels more in line with the 2009 enterprise than it does anything that they've done recently and i i don't remember what the titan looks like in because the titan showed up in season one right because that was the one ship that they copy and pasted at the end with yeah all the, the and i don't think it looks like this does it i don't think it looks that different from this 
it's it's the right, same general one. idea, I think. Um, let me see. Is the Titan? I I I feel it's maybe it's maybe not as. Uh, yeah, I mean it's. I guess it doesn't have. Here, I'll copy this. I'm gonna send this to you. Okay. It's um. It's a little. It doesn't have it. It's a little bit squatter. I guess would be the way to describe it. It doesn't have the oh. upward facing nacelles. Okay, yeah, that feels more like a post TNG design. This this picture I just sent you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas the one in the new one feels a lot more r- like retro. It feels more like the original Enterprise than it does. It does anything yeah. newer. Yeah, I mean they they call it you know just so you don't miss that they call it a neo constitution. <laughs> they don't right. they don't even yeah. give it a new name. They just reference something that you're gonna understand yeah um i like the design i mean i it got me i mean the things that i care about the things that i care about in star trek they got me in this because i like i like the ship um i like the the uh i think they've dialed in the uniforms nicely yeah because it's the i like the black i like the the um the deep space nine color scheme where it's the black in the bottom and the color on top but mm-hmm. they added the uh they actually added the um lower decks split right so it, it opens up from the side like the lower decks uniforms does the yep. only thing is it just it i mean and i know they're matching the style of the rest of the show but it's they're so fucking dark like when when uh they're talking to seven of nine on the bridge I for a second I thought she was wearing all black mm-hmm. because the red is so deep. Right. Which is strange cuz the yellow stands out pretty well, but the red is just like this deep burgundy red that that does not really pop. Mm-hmm. And I don't think anything's really designed to pop in this show, but no. um Blends god forbid. In. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's tough to it's tough to hide the yellow, I guess. Uh I don't know if we saw a blue color, but No, no, no blue. No yeah. Blue. Uh well, actually I don't um, hold on. I just saw a picture. Yes, there were some blue in that uh when they Board welcomed the them to the ship. Yeah. Uh there's a couple and even the blue the blue's pretty dark as well. It's like a darker teal color. Yeah. Yeah. But I like I like the design. I like the pin. Um Yeah. The uniforms look good, ship looks good. Uh That's all I care about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know what to, I don't know what else to talk about. It's one of those things I um I feel like there's a lot there, but I don't know where it's going to be really. Although I, I I just have like my my feelings about it are entirely based on where I think it's going to go because I don't think this is going to mm-hmm. surprise us really at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I I just feel. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. Like I, I, I like Frakes. I still don't feel like Stuart feels doesn't feel like Picard to me, really. And it might just be- there was, sorry, the scene where they're in the bunk beds. There was a there was a part where Picard was talking, and his voice was the timber of his voice was so low and and old. Yeah, I weak. Hate to put weak it sounding. Th- I hate to put it that way. He almost sounded like a robot. Mm-hmm. Like it had this weird like timber to it and i was i was kind of thinking like are they leaning into the fact that he's a robot person here (laughs) which i don't think that they were but it it was it was it's so strange to hear him sound so old yes and i mean i i assume is that is that just how he is in real life i haven't seen him outside of the show is is that how he sounds he just can't lay down and talk i don't think that's that's hard for he's not playing older than he is he actually this is just him he seems pretty. He's old at this point, you know. He's just he's yeah. an old old guy. Shatner's aged better than Stewart has. Um, Shatner's like 150 years old and he looks great. So I don't, I don't yeah, know. that's true. The, the context of that bunk scene was funny. I just because Picard is talking about like, so, oh, I haven't seen Beverly Crusher in 20 years, and then it cuts back up to Frakes on top. I just I expected the bunks to start shaking. You know, is this this awkward moment where they're sharing this uh, this cabin or whatever? But it's like. Just the the whole the whole Crusher and Picard thing is funny too. Like they they have they as you're saying they have to do this exposition thing. So Laris is like, you wanted to, 
bone her, didn't you, Picard? And he's like, oh, I did, Laris. Like, we had a relationship. It's like, well, you know. I so who said for who's up for subtlety? <clears throat> I was expecting this. This is the kind of writing that they do on Star Trek now. So I was surprised that they didn't make this joke. But Picard's like, I haven't seen her in twenty five years. We didn't end on great terms. And then when they're walking around on the ship, they hear the music playing, and and Riker's like, "What is that?" And Picard's like, "Oh, it's it's part of a a compilation that I made for Beverly for blah 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 blah." I a hundred percent Riker. I, I yeah, I thought Riker was going to take a beat and go. You made her a mixtape, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because that's the kind of joke that they do in the show now. But I, I it, it didn't even, yeah. They just he just made her. That's why she didn't call you back, John Luke. You made her a mixtape. <laughs> it was just a lot. Of it was pure Beethoven. Songs. It was Beethoven, my favorite Chopin, and my Chemical Romance. <laughs> <laughs> my bloody valentine clay get your plug in um have you ever heard of the plain white tees <laughs> well let's this is the good part let's sit down and listen to this part right here take him to the well, bridge well one of my favorite songs i put on there is by a group called the ben folds five they are actually only three men it's hilarious <laughs> it's called brick and it's about abortion <laughs> Is, what is that? The uh, there's that Parks and Rec joke. This is my my favorite song about the industrialized meat industry or something like that. But the uh, when they have um, oh, the second Ron comes onto the show. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. So you're more positive on this than I am. I think I'm just I'm I'm trying not to be cynical about yeah, it yeah. until same, we same. get a bigger sample out of you. You being pretty cynical about it. <laughs> I well, I mean because it's I understand. Like I understand where you're coming from, but mm. I you know I I'm I want to I'm leaving it leaving myself open to get a bigger sample size before I really come down on it. Yeah. And. Because I, I will say that, the, yes, there are – there's a lot of elements that do feel recycled in as far as, like, structure and, and a lot of the look and stuff like that. But I, I don't want to – I don't – and, I, you know, the, the dialogue is clunky, but I don't want to storyline-wise cut it off at the knees before they, you know, they get the chance to tell the story. Yeah. Which is what I what I try to which is what I try to do with every every season every time we go into a new season of these new shows. But yeah, I my my embarrassment at this point would be you fooled me once, shame on me, you. You fooled me twice, shame on me. If you fool me a third time, I'm just a fucking never, idiot, never right? Get fooled, won't, won't get fooled again. Yeah, I, I won't the, get fooled as the president again, said. as, as uh, Mr. Bush would say, like. <clears throat> I'm all for a fair shake, I suppose, and I'll give the show a fair shake, I think. But at a certain point, I feel that I, w I would look ridiculous not seeing these same things and thinking things are going to be different this time. Sure, yeah. Um, I <clears throat> And what I, what, I, what I think is going to happen is that I think that the nostalgic thing that you're talking about which is that they're trying to draw people in to watch this third season is going to give this season a false historical memory of being much better than it's going to be <laughs> which is which is a lot mm. of predictions about what's going on but i'm deeply unsettled by <clears throat> like for instance the reviews on this one right are either people love it or they go this is the same shit that they've been giving us for three years now and yeah. I personally think that the this is the same shit argument seems much stronger because all of the positives about it seem to come down to people who really love the reference stuff that's going on mm -hmm. in it and who really love the fact that the characters are returning. They got rid of all the new characters that people didn't like. And as far as I can tell, that's it because there's there's nothing – who's that that blowhard, that Robert Bernard Myers or whatever that guy's name is? He was saying the first he, he had some clip that was saying the first scene of this is going to have you going this is Star Trek the Next Generation 
Beverly Crush is running around with a fucking plasma rifle <laughs> in the first scene. Maybe he meant specifically the scene where we're just listening to dialogue from 30 years ago. Maybe. Maybe he fell asleep. Or maybe he just orgasmed and left the room at that point after maybe, he heard that. Maybe he hit the wrong button on the remote <laughs> and actually played an episode of The Next Generation. I don't think I'm misquoting him. I think he he filmed some absurd... YouTube short where he spoke dramatically into the camera saying that you're going to love this the moment you see it, set your eyes on it. And all I've seen is Frakes. That's the only thing that makes me go, this is kind of fun. This will be something yeah. enjoyable. But yeah. the rest of it is is all the same stuff that I've seen before. Um, and I'm willing to be proven wrong here. Hopefully the show proves me wrong. But there's only so many times you can set up a plot with a galaxy-threatening weapon that is the portal gun from the Portal <laughs> yes. video game series. <laughs> And which which is cut which was kind of I didn't know what was going on but then when I figured it out it's like oh that's kind of awesome <laughs> <laughs> I found well, I found the I thought that the uh, the portal gun was kind of cool mm-hmm. I thought that the overdone scream sound effect was too much it was like people were yeah. screaming as it was pouring <laughs> stuff out of the g- <laughs> that was kind of weird yeah it sounded like ants screaming or something and it just it went mm-hmm. on for a little bit too long but. I, I just see the um, I see that I've seen what this villain looks like in the t- in the teaser. I have, I've seen Rafi's drug addiction storyline thing come back. I've heard this exposition dialogue that they're doing, and I just I don't see how you can possibly change it from what it was. It all feels very similar to me. That's all. Yeah, I you know it's tough, right? Because um, it's never going to be TNG. Right, correct, yeah. Just by the, I don't even mean that like by a time-space standpoint, but I mean like just the structure, they're not going to all of a sudden change the show back to, so it matches like structurally and 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 tonally with Correct, because it's too jarring to do that at this point. Right. So... You kind of you, you kind of have to accept that it's going to be a continuation in that sense of what they've been doing, um, and the thing is, is it's like I don't know where the bar is for a season like this, honestly, mm. <clears throat> because the first two seasons were trying to do something new to a certain extent while arguably relying too much on old stuff to get them over the uh, over the finish line there. Yeah. <clears throat> but this one this is this is like it's it's you're expe- I guess you you're it's more of a victory lap kind of show. Yes. Where it's like yeah, yeah I mean, you know, getting the guys back together, you're probably going to makes the similar jokes and the same kind of reference like so it's i feel like they're kind of this sort of show is built more for that but at the same time it's like i mean they never did that in the movies you know like they never it's not like in star trek nemesis they were dropping references to the show left and right i mean maybe they were i don't remember but i don't think they were no because they were still of that era you know yeah right yeah yeah so i don't know it's it's tough because I don't really know what 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 the bar is for this. Um and the th- I've been very fascinated by how drastically the people who were so anti or or so negative on the first two seasons yeah. have come around so hard on this. Yes. And to be fair, a lot of those people have seen six episodes and we've only seen the first one. Um yep. Yeah. So that also plays into it. But I'm I'm kind of that's what I'm more interested in because like at the end of the day, if we get to the end of it and we go, yeah, it was kind of basically more of the same, like that doesn't really even bother me anymore because it's like I, I my my bar starts there. Yeah. For like what I expect from this. Yeah. And so if that's the bar they hit, it's like, yeah, okay, whatever. Sure, I guess it's put it on the pile with all the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. But so many people seem to be claiming that it's different and it's it's better than that. And so I'm more curious to be like, okay, all right, let's see what you can do. Let's see what is what is it that's making everybody turn so hard in the positive direction. 
Did you um in, for something that like as far as the internet goes, yeah, in this day and age should be nothing but scorn from these people. You know what I mean? Like this is the kind of thing where it's true. Usually something like this with as many references and stuff like that is just going to get dunked on. But the people who do the dunking usually are the ones who really like it. And so it's kind of confusing me in that way. And I'm not really sure what's going on there. But again, only seen the first episode. Yeah. Maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe Cybox shows up next episode and it gets great. I don't know. Well, but, did you did you end up reading Darren's review of it? I, I have not I didn't. read that. I, I haven't. I haven't been. I've been trying not to read through. I've read like one or two of them. Uh, yeah. I think I read one positive, and I think I read one of the ones that was more negative. I can't remember, but yeah, I've seen. I've just seen a lot of people saying like, "Oh yeah, this guy usually hates the show, and he really liked it." That kind of stuff. Yes, I've seen a lot of that too. Although I don't, I don't know because so, I guess that my so. I guess it's an interesting sort of clash of uh, our own personalities about whether or not what this is is going to bother us. Because you were just saying that, like, if if it ends up being the same thing as what it has been, it's just another bad season of Star Trek to put on the pile. Yeah, I mean, it's like I I would feel a lot worse about this if this was the first season and it sucked. Like, yep. if, if they came out of the gate with we're bring, we're getting the crew back together, and then it was like the bottom feeder garbage of season one and season two, I would be a lot more upset. But by this, by this point, I'm just like, yeah, I, you know, my, my expectations for this show are so low that if it sucks, then I don't ever have to think about it again. And I can just go back and watch yeah. the stuff that I like. Yes. I don't disagree with that. I don't think, um, I would also like I I guess my my reticence of doing that is that is that it's it's such a lot of TV to consume mm. and it sucks, you know? Yeah. Like yes. like it's yeah. <laughs> to, to go back like to I wish I could go back and not have seen not have wasted 20 hours of my, like a day of my life watching the first two seasons. You know what I yeah. mean? Like that's yeah. when you, when you start adding it up, you start to go like, what a waste of time. So my, my entire drive for it to be good is that I just, <clears throat> I think, it, I think it's just a harbinger of um, where like modern television is in a lot of ways too. Mm. It's not even really just like a Star Trek problem at this point, but it's like, they're just, you know, we're forced to watch it because it's a Star Trek podcast. And so we watch Star Trek stuff. Mm -hmm. But now that the franchise has moved into the modern sensibility of it, which is that we have a franchise and we're going to we have to desperately try to find what will keep people coming back to watch this thing that we've got. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're going to do here is we tried to do something different, but it was a colossal failure. So let's just bring back everyone that we know and we'll get all the familiar faces. And I, I think that makes me upset just because it's like so wildly insulting to the audience that's watching it. And I think that that kind of stuff feeds into the plot and the writing that they do here, which is that, it's just a string of you elbowing the person next to you saying, did you get that? Did you get that yeah. reference? And there's only so many references like that they can string together before I start going like, why not just have chat GPT write this fucking shit then, you know? Right, yeah. What, what, like, yeah. Where, where's, the, where's the humanity in any of this? You're just giving us stuff that we know we're going to expect and you're pulling random Wikipedia facts, just have chat GPT. They'll probably write a better fucking story than this. Just do that and just give up on uh, trying to make this about something or like have a human experience or like, God forbid, like feel something as you watch these shows. Yeah. Um, I just haven't felt any of that. It's all It all rides on the feelings. And I think that a lot of the YouTubers who like it now were claiming to have problems with the plot of the first two seasons and stuff like that and the acting and the decisions. But all they really wanted was the warm hug of the nostalgia that they weren't getting. 
And right, if they're yeah. given it, they will overlook all the other problems. Yeah. So I just find it kind of sad. Like I, I watch it and Stuart's old. Star Trek is yeah. old. Yeah. And it's just, you know, maybe they were just at this point in our Star Trek careers. But I just, I, I would be so shocked if there was just some sort of like really different, interesting take from a Star Trek episode. And it just, and, and it wasn't just rep- repetition of stuff we've seen before with a different gleam or gloss on it. I was going to make an incendiary comment about, uh, oh, go for it. What that, what, um, what you're saying about why the haters like this one might say about what they actually want out of a star Wars movie. Uh, but I'll keep that to myself. <laughs> is, is that a, 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 an incendiary comment on me for, for liking? No, the, the movie no, no. Oh, okay. No, good. no, it's, it's cause I mean, I'm, I'm probably, I'm on the fence about that movie more than I dislike it. Oh, sure. I, it's, it's the kind of thing where it's like, yeah, okay. I mean, you know, this is what you want. I mean, what, what do you want out of a star Wars movie? You yeah. Know. Anyway, I won't get into that. Um, you know, well, well, let's end it with the the. I've I've been watching. Uh, the kids uh, really like lightsaber fights to watch. Them. Yeah, because they, they're fucking great. Yeah, they they don't like the Star Wars movies. Interestingly, they're like this yeah. is incredibly boring. But they will have me just put on the YouTube uh, thing about the uh, it shows like every lightsaber fight, and they watch nice. that. And I think we should do a Patreon special about the Obi Wan Anakin. Was it Mustafar fight? Oh, from Revenge of the Sith. That is the worst piece of cinema. I oh, think it's that terrible. <laughs> it's so I've it's never so seen dumb. In it's my like, life. and I've watched it a thousand times now. I'm just, I'm like an expert on how awful it is. Like like that is sort of kind of not entirely dissimilar to what you're saying about this, and kind of what I'm thinking as well. Because it's like that that fight is just such like you want your fucking fight here choke on it have, it, have all the lightsaber fight in the world and yeah. it's it's like it to the point where it, it it's I, I i feel so cynical watching that because it's just like i understand what you're trying to do here but it's just too much like there's no it's just pouring gravy on top of the potatoes until there's nothing left <laughs> washing those potatoes away yeah but you know was as far as this show goes right yeah. like the thing i'm kind of surprised about a little bit is they're going so far out of their way to to jettison the first two seasons why didn't they do that stylistically across the board why didn't they just go like, all right? Oh, it's well, like a know, counter to your original point of like, you can't change at this point. Why not make a change? Well, no, like just like the way it looks. Yeah, you know, like it's it looks like the other two seasons of the show. Yes. which means it's dark and depressing. Why not change the way it looks? Put a couple lights on the fucking bridge, and like change it that way. And because it feels so weirdly mashed together to me. Where it's like we're kind of trying to do this thing that's that's closer to what people r- recognize from TNG. Yeah, sorry. Where do you, where are you? I know we're late in the podcast, but I should have brought this up earlier. Where are you getting that tone from? I guess because I I would say that the tone of this one. Is... I think you're right. I think it's all Frakes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think. I mean, he's like the the the, the driving force of that like everything else is pretty consistent okay with how the show is how the new truck shows up because all the backstory of that we've heard about people has been very doom and gloomy about them. yes yeah. yeah so i think it's, i but, think it's going to be a sad season again <laughs> I, I fucking hope not <laughs> uh Frank's, Riker's getting a divorce like he's in the middle of a divorce yeah i don't know like, crusher's yeah, been like, out there doing and that's, something that's part of it right you've i think that's what i'm what i'm kind of getting at like you've got Riker, who's acting like Riker, at least acting like the the modern cultural yeah, idea of what Riker was. An is. older version of Riker, I yeah. think, is a good description. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think that he's acting out of character, let's no, put it that way. No. But that character just doesn't... And so he's like bringing a bit of, 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 of levity and charisma into this sorrow vacuum. Yes. And... Uh, it's like he's the only person in color constantly walking around in a black and white movie. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know why they didn't try to just like shift away from this dreariness and embrace the TNG thing, like the 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 look of it. I, I'm not saying it needs to go. 
I, I don't want it to look exactly like the show. Right. The, the, to have just lights years everywhere. Yeah. yeah, that's that's not what I mean. But yeah. it's just like if they're going to jettison everything else, why not reconceptualize what the show looks like visually and maybe I don't know, make it a little bit more appealing and less yeah. depressing visually to look at. No, that's what I that's my <clears throat> I just think they're in a rut with this stuff. This is just like they know this mm-hmm. is what they do. Because I I could see if your final season Picard, have Picard go out and he gets on the Titan or whatever, and it's basically 10 episodes of finish finishing out the character stories that we know and going on like an adventure each week. And like, like not something, not some doomsday weapon with some megalomaniacal villain that we're going to run into. Not endless tears about stuff. Not mm-hmm. meeting Jack Crusher the second or something like that. Is is it so? He's not. He's a new character, right? Yeah, he's the, he's Wesley's better half. I suppose. Are we yeah. are we supposed to think that this is Picard's son? That I think that's the implication. Is that the yeah? Because yeah. because you could tell because he's British. Yes, exactly. because everyone knows <laughs> you your that. accent. You inherit your <laughs> accent. Yes. Yeah, they um, don't call him Jack, but yeah. he is. Uh, been confirmed his name is jack crusher so yeah um yeah i I, uh yeah i i don't you know one thing i did want to mention is i know one of the lines that gets uh that got pulled out by detractors of the show was when shaw makes the crack about um we're not. We don't go around blowing things up, which I'm sure is depressing or to you guys or something like that. Cause impl- implying that they are, that Riker and Picard are cowboy, uh, cowboy, yeah, yeah, yeah. gunslingers. And it's like that's not what Star Trek was about. I was like, oh, oh sure, yeah, whatever. But it kind of was to a certain extent. Like watching Star Trek, they're blowing a lot of sh- shit up. Mm-hmm. I think the problem is that line is being fed through this modern Trek filter which recasts them as gunslingers when that's not really what they were like they did blow a lot of stuff up though so it's like it's it's a weird kind of thing where it's like not i think he's totally wrong right to to imply that picard is not someone who is like extremely regimented and regulated during his career yeah yeah it's it's i think he's wrong i think he's wrong in that sense but like it's it's a weird it's a weird way to play it because they did go on a bunch of adventures where they did blow stuff up, but they weren't like, you know, flying around with their seatbelts off. You know, they no. they, they were no. they were doing they were yeah they were very regimented. So it's a weird it's a weird line to put in there, and to have them kind of look at each other. It's just, like I don't know. It's I it's I feel like that's getting amplified by the the vibe of the show, yeah. which is recasting a lot of stuff. Yeah. in that sense. And I don't really know why they need to do that. Yeah, um, I, I, because I, I forgot to mention it, but I would have pulled out that line as a fundamental misunderstanding of where the characters are supposed to be in, like, because I, I think it's easy. Like, I, I think what's so frustrating about the Shaw scene is that Shaw is very easily capable of being written as a great impediment to these two, and. The way that they set him up is pretty good. It's just that he has a couple qualities that annoy me. One being that thing where he he seems to not completely understand Picard and Riker because he seems mm-hmm. to describe them incorrectly. But also he is sort of he's also kind of needlessly cruel in a few scenes for no particularly good reason. Um mm-hmm. he you know, he has this sort of like because he's he's the minute that they get on the ship, he's antagonistic towards them. And I don't really know why that's done except for just pace necessity that he needs to mm-hmm. be immediately upset with them. He's kind of insulting to Riker about jazz and stuff. And maybe this is the sort of the way that the character is going to be described. But I, I just think that he could have been written in a way that he is a sympathetic character that you understand where his point of view is coming from. And he accurately understands what these characters in this show are doing yeah right and he's not because he's basing his entire understanding of them on the tng days but that doesn't apply to this if he if he had said listen picard i heard what you did last year with the soon droids and i heard that you, you <laughs> that's know that's true you yeah. know 
like bring that shit that, up. That's that's a more that's a more apt reference to make. Yeah. Um. It, it honestly it honestly feels like a line that would fit better for Kirk, because if yes. you had old man Kirk on that ship, I of course would be like, listen, Kirk. You've stolen a starship more than once, so uh, <laughs> I'll keep my eyes on you, buddy. <laughs> yes, exactly. But listen, we're not going searching for the, for Shangri La here, buddy. <laughs> I got to be back in time for Celebration Day or whatever the fuck they're doing. Yeah, that's it. Well, speaking I, of, yep. of all the things, of all the things that they've pulled out of the, the toy chest mm. across all of the modern Star Trek, I still cannot believe that they have not figured out a way to get. William Shatner involved somehow in the like, modern I don't know. shows. Yeah, yeah, I don't. Uh, I have assumed. I assume that they have driven a dump truck full of money up to his house. Yeah, it's him. And he right? just. I. It, it must be. Yeah, like must I be. can't imagine that they haven't tried, because like, he, I don't know. Like uh, even, I don't. I don't know what how you would do it. What it would be, but like. Especially, I'm surprised that there's not someone at his house right uh, every other day being like, "Have you seen what they did to Mark Hamill in <laughs> in the Mandalorian show? Have you seen those clips from the Indiana Jones movie?" Yeah. Will we can we can make you look young again, buddy? Yeah. Just yeah. just come in here and give us. You don't even have to listen. The technology's so good, you don't even have to record your lines. We can just make the robot sound like you. You just have to sign off on just letting us use your face. Give us the rights to your face, please. That's all we want. Yeah. And I'm sure he's like, listen, I'll do it as long as I get to punch Leonard Nimoy in the face <laughs> and kick George Takai in the balls. <laughs> yeah. Well, good on, good on you, uh, Bill Shatner. You can, you can do what you need to do. All right, I guess we're done with this one. Um, I was fairly negative on it. Clay was a little bit more positive. But we'll see where the season goes with uh, Picard's third season. I think this is the last question. Do you think this is the final season, if it does well? Oh, I have to assume, yes. Yeah. I, I can't imagine their... Uh... I mean, this one. was shot like three years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, this was shot concurrently with the second, I, I think. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's been at least... A year, two years. I don't yeah. know how long it's been. Yeah, but I, yeah, I have to imagine this is this is it. Um, I mean, you know. Well, here, here's a question: mm. What if it's not? What if, let's say, the breakout character from this show is like Jordy, doing whatever he's doing, <laughs> or Worf? Let's say it's yeah, Worf. Could be Worf. Would you be? I mean, how would you feel if they're like, we're going to do a new show? It's going to be Worf leading. Section 31 or whatever the fuck he's doing. <laughs> I'm already upset because the ending to Worf's character on DS9 where he becomes an ambassador between Kronos and Earth mm -hmm. is a perfect ending for him. Yeah. And now he's like a ninja or something. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, all, I'm already a little bit upset that the perfect ending for the Worf character, which is a man between two worlds, spends gets a job in retirement that like bridges the gap between those yeah. two worlds. Yeah. And now he's running Section 31, sending chat GPT messages to <laughs> Raffi, knowing that she's a drug addict or something like that. So I don't know. We'll see. But uh, we got a lot of characters left. We got Jordy. We got... Data, or one of the soon siblings, or whatever it is. We got Troy. We've got Worf to show up. We got a lot of stuff to come on. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Everybody. I'm curious. I'm curious how they're going to justify needing them to stick around because I assume they're going to. I saw one review that says one of them gets a uh, very obvious short shrift, like one of them oh, really? just kind of shows up and doesn't have anything to do. But I don't know who that <laughs> is. Is it the rest of them in a in a car? Driving down the street, and then someone goes, <laughs> "Is that Deanna Troy?" It's, it's, it's got to no, be Troy, it wasn't. right? It's got to be Troy. To, who gets I have to assume it probably is. Yeah. yeah, I think so. All right, guys, we're done. Thanks everybody for listening. Thank you for supporting all of this stuff. Thank you for listening to our Picard coverage. Let us know what you thought. The Discord seems to be fairly positive on it, so we'll see. I might be wrong. Hopefully, I'm wrong. But thanks for listening anyway. Clay, do you have anything you want to say before we go? Uh, not particularly. Uh, keep checking out the, what we're doing on Patreon for Rotten Heart Picture Show. 
doing some video nasties, getting uh, getting goopy, mm-hmm. bloody disgusting with it. So mm-hmm. join us over there. Check out the Deadwood podcast. If you guys haven't checked that out yet, check out Deadwood. It's a good show. <laughs> That's it. It is, it is a good show. It is a good show. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll see you next week with... Do you know what the next episode is called, Clay? Uh, to boldly go. Disengage. Ah. Yeah. Is it going to be a rap battle? How many of the episode titles are going to be puns on TNG phrases and titles? If if it were me writing them, all of them. All of them. I'm going to go yeah. 8 out of 10, I think. That will be my guess. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed Picard Season 3, Episode 1. We'll see you next week.